Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebra. Today, uh, the topic is, uh, or are the isomorphism theorems. There are three of them. And when you see them for the first time, they're a little bit mysterious because they're abstractly formulated and they're abstract theorems. But the beauty is they generalize something all of you know, namely basic multiplication rules or certain rules for multiplying numbers. And that's what I'm going to explain today. So the point will be that there are certain very well-known rules for how to multiply numbers and the theorems generalize them in up to a ridiculous generality. I'm only going to touch um, upon the statement for groups, but there's something similar that works for rings, for algebras, for modules in the categorical setup and so on and so on. So these are really good and these are really important to remember. And at least my idea to remember them or my approach to remember them would be to just think about what are those doing for, for, uh, for just in the integers, for multiplication of integers, multiplication, division, whatever of integers you will see. So let's just jump right into it, into the um, first one. So the first one is kind of a generalization of the following statement. So the only cyclic groups that you can see are, oh, well, there's an infinite cyclic group, the integers itself, you can, well, that's what it is. And otherwise, these are the Z mod AZ. Remember, Z mod AZ is just the group um, of elements zero up to A minus one of remainders upon division by A and considered additively, otherwise it won't be a group. So uh, for example, um, example, if A would be seven, uh, then you could have something like three plus six in, in this Z mod A would be a nine and nine has a remainder two by seven. So Z, three plus six would be two. So that was just Z mod AZ. This is the finite group. Uh, it always appears everywhere. And kind of the reason is um, the, first, uh, the first isomorphism theorem in disguise um, because all cyclic groups are finite. So what is a cyclic group? A cyclic group is that what I already taught by CA and it's just a group generated by one element and all other group element is just the power of, the first, of this element. And the only thing you assume is that it's cyclic. So at one point you hit the identity. So G to the A is one. And there's a kind of an obvious map from Z to CA, which just sends one to, to this one generator. And the kernel of this map, which is this kernel of this map, um, so kernel, is exactly A times Z, right? The kernel of this map, so the kernel of what is, uh, is that just all elements that are sent to one, which are the elements that are sent to one? Well, look at this condition, G to the A is one, so all multiples of A will be sent to one. And that's all I'm saying. And then you have this funny diagram here, or this one, which says you have an F, which is then your map from Z to the cyclic group. And you have, a, you know, the kernel, that's, that's AZ. And if you quotient by the kernel, then you get an isomorphism, which shows that all cyclic groups are actually isomorphic to Z mod A for certain A. And the first isomorphism theorem will generalize this group. Okay, we'll see it later. So the second, uh, or rather the third, I should say. So in the literature, this is the third isomorphism theorem, but I think it's a bit easier than the second. So I stated, uh, well, as, as the second isomorphism theorem. And I claim it generalizes the following. So this one was a generalization of, well, everything that is cyclic, so modular arithmetic is the only cyclic, cyclic way of division and uh, remainders, so the only cyclic way how groups can work. And this is kind of even easier in some sense. So it's, it's this ridiculously simple equality in numbers, B over A equals, well, B over C divided by A over C. So the only thing I did is I sneaked in this little C here. And of course this cancels out. So, so this is ridiculously simple. Um, it's consolation, right? It's consolation of, of division or multiplication. This is, this is the rule. And this is generalized by the sec, sorry, by my second isomorphism theorem by the third isomorphism. And this is how it looks like. So A over B, oh, I probably should choose a different color. So um, 
this and you can sneak in a C, right? I sneak in a C again, and you can just cancel out the C. It's exactly the same statement. You can sneak in a C, you can cancel it out. So A over B, uh, sorry, AZ over BZ is isomorphic to AZ over CZ divided by BZ over CZ. And what really happens is this consolation. So you have A over C, this is A over C, uh, A and C. You have B and C, that's, that's a, that's a uh, red one, B and C. And kind of A and B is this missing piece here and you just brought it to the other side, such as you can cancel out numbers. And this really just generalizes that six, something like, for example, here's an explicit example. Six over three equals 12 over three divided by, by uh, uh, 12 over six. Of course, this just cancels out. Um, and what you get is six over three. Uh, a, a slight catch and something a little bit confusing before you ask why am I writing B over A and here A over B? Well, it's a little bit of a confusing notation, but A o, A Z is not of size A. A Z is still infinite, right? But it's it's of size one over A times the size of Z. So it's in some sense, what's written here is actually B over A and not A over B. It, it turns around because the notation is a little bit silly. Um, but just it, it basically is consolation. You just have to keep in mind that things turn around because the notation, as I said, is a little bit silly. But it, it's too standard to uh, for me to change it. And so I, just 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 don't be confused. Okay, so generalization of a of consolation. That's the third, or in my case, the second isomorphism theorem. And then you have the second one, which is usually stated as, 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 as the third one in my case, which is usually stated as the second one. But it's it's a much harder rule, and um, the isomorphism theorem is also much more mysterious. If you see it for the first time, it isn't so bad, but it generalizes um, this rule, which is not completely trivial. If you think about it, it's also not very hard. Namely, uh, well, the B divided by the GCD equals the um, uh, lowest common multiple divided by A. And this is generalized by the following funny diagram. So I've written down here what happens. Very good. Um, so if you think about it for a second, then this one, AZ plus BZ, has actually a generating element by something that's called Bezus lemma. And that's exactly the UCD, okay? While on the other hand, this one, ZA uh, intersect BZ has also a generating element, which is the other one, the lowest common multiple. And then you just use the following isomorphism theorem. It's, it's a little bit of, of a complicated theorem, but it basically works like this. You have a big thing here, and you have a, in, in the middle, you have two middle things and you have a small thing and you have another middle thing. And the statement is basically big divided by middle equals middle divided by small. So the big thing in this case is AZ plus BZ and BZ and AZ are com completely, in, in this case, you can't compare them. So they are on the same height. And the intersection of both is of course very small. It's contained in both, right? It's really this type of diagram. The big one contains everything in the middle and um, the, the bottom one is contained in, in, in everything. And what you do is the quotient here is isomorphic to the quotient here, right? And this really generalizes, as I explained here, that this, this rule B over GCD equals uh, LCM over A. For example, if B is six, so this is B and A is 21, A then, well, I hope I did my homework correct. And three is the greatest common divisor and 42 is the lowest common multiple. Okay, this slightly um, mysterious rule, it's not so bad. It just generalizes something that is a little bit more complicated than this little bit silly consolation. And that's exactly then the statement. So um, the, the really the three isomorphism theorems that you need to remember are exactly those. Okay, so whenever you have a map and you want it to be subjective, that's a non, that's not a really strict, uh, uh, strong assumption. You can just say H is the image instead of H is just what it is. 
So, but anyway, so in this statement, I want it to be subjective and you take the kernel and then G mod the kernel is isomorphic to H. Okay. So whenever you have a group homomorphism that's subjective, divide by the kernel and you have an isomorphism. Uh, this was the statement that only uh, cyclic groups are Z and AZ. This generalization of the statement generalizes to ridiculous generality, um, way beyond the, ca the case of groups. And here was the statement, this, this funny consolation statement, and it works like this. If you have a, um, a sequence of, of normal subgroups, then it's exactly the consolation I showed you before. So G over M is isomorphic to G over N divided by M over N. Um, so G over M is isomorphic to, and now you sneak in N. Right, and you can you can just cancel it out. The only slight catch here is that you want normal subgroups because these are the right quotient, quotient, uh, the right notion of quotients in the theory of groups. That that's the only slight catch here. And this is the last statement. This generalization of the uh, this rule involving the greatest common divisor and the lowest common multiple. And it works like this. Well, you have a subgroup S. You have a normal group N. Then S times N is really big because it contains both S and N. Yeah. Flop, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Flop, flop. And very small is S intersected by N. That's contained in, in both N and S. And the statement is that this thing here and this thing here, they are isomorphic. So big, big divided by middle is isomorphic to middle divided by small. Okay, so um, those are the three theorems and th my way to remember them is really to look at those, those graphs here, right? As those illustrations, they're not graphs, illustrations. And that's the way to remember them, at least for me. I hope that works for you. And let me give you a fun application, not of the third one, but, uh, but let's say of the, of the uh, two first ones. So let's say you would like to understand something that is, which is actually very complicated. So R mod Q, okay? So uh, additive group R modulo additive group Q. Of course, uh, that's a normal subgroup. You can mod out by it. And this is, this is a complicated group, R mod Q. Kind of what you need to study are transcendental numbers and so on. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. You, you don't want to do that. Or nah, imaginary numbers, it's very hard. What is a much easier group is R modulo Z. And that's a bit surprising because why should R modulo Z be much easier than R modulo Q? Well, there's a, there's a uh, group homomorphism, all of you know, which goes from R to the circle. And the circle is a group, the circle is an easy group um, where multiplication is given by addition of angles. I cover that in some other in some other video. So you can actually define a group homomorphism from R to the circle group by, by just the usual exponential map. X prop two pi i blank. Okay. Blank is of course the angle that you want to put in. And the kernel of this map is just once turning around. Every time you once turn around, or the other way, doesn't matter. So the kernel is exactly Z. And then the isomorphism tells you that R mod Z is isomorphic to the to the circle. So R mod Z is easy. R mod Z is easy. And now you can play this game by sneaking in something. So you still want to understand R mod Q. And actually, you just sneak in. So just write it again, R mod Q, make it a bit longer. And you sneak in your Z here now. And you get an isomorphism, and you only already understand this group, so it only remains to understand this group. And I don't know how, so Q mod Z, and I don't know how you feel. Q mod Z looks a little bit easier to me than uh, R mod Q, right? No imaginary numbers or whatever. It look, looks much more interesting. And this is a cute application of, um, of, of the first two isomorphism theorems. With a slight catch that actually this one, I, I remind you, this one actually is the third in the in the usual literature, but I think it's just much easier than the so-called second. So I stated, I stated it as a second. 
Anyway, um, that's it for today. So all I wanted to explain today is that the three isomorphism theorems are not mysterious beasts. They actually arise very naturally by studying what happens for numbers. The second one is in particular very easy to remember. You just sneak in something, right? It's just this G uh, over M, and now you just sneak in um, whatever N, right? And you can console it out. This is very, very useful. And, and usually you really want to sneak in something for most applications. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you next time.